the prime purpose for us to be here is to learn to love again. Unlimited, unconditional, all-inclusive and selfless divine cosmic love. Most of us come here to undo our karma, but we can also come here to learn certain qualities of life, like for instance, compassion. Therefore, we may have make a soul contract with another soul who would agree to incarnate and be our adversary. They make a contract with us that says, I will incarnate with you and I will give you tasks and situations to make sure that you learn deep down whatever we are facing is karmic and there we have to do the clearing up learn to forgive repent no longer do the mistakes all these things we do never alone we have got the whole bounty of heaven on our side an incredible time to be born Welcome back to the Inspired Evolution and today we're welcoming back Hans Wilhelm. Hans, it is such a treat to have you back here again today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm honored to be invited and Maida, it's always a joy to talk with you and let's see what comes up today. So I'm really as anxious and interested what will happen tonight as you might be. So let's let's have a lovely conversation. Oh my goodness, it is always such a pleasure. And I have to say, yes, we are definitely in for a journey. For those tuning into Hans for the first time here, we have had two other conversations with Hans, equally as rich as each other. And it leaves a very tall order today for us to, <laughs> or for me anyway, to live up to another really tall conversation. But as is Hans' way, he is a world renowned author, he's an illustrator, a spiritual guide. He's best known for his insightful Life Explained series. He's written, there's over 200 children books that he's like that have been translated into 30 languages um, and his storytelling, you know, he educates people globally. If you want to get, get a taste of this, I highly recommend his Life Explained YouTube channel where the videos delve into all the different mysteries of life. Um, and I literally mean all the different mysteries of life, mysticism, spirituality, some of the quantum field of like how we're here and some really grounded stuff as well. He's offering deep insights into spirituality and some of life's biggest existential questions. He is, in my humble opinion, and hopefully this is okay for me to say to you, Hans, a master at simplifying really big, complex concepts. And uh, yeah, for me, he stands as a beacon in literature and spiritual wisdom, just, you know, being able to share such knowledge with such warmth and simplicity. Um, yeah, is really masterful. And I'm so glad to have you here again, Hans. So that's just for those that are tuning in for the first time. Now you know what you're in for. Strap yourself in. Let's have a yummy, like, yummy conversation. <laughs> I agree, yeah. <laughs> Before we reached out into today's conversation, um, you did ask me, you know, what are some of the things that you wanted to, to cover the ground on? And last we spoke about the life school, school, like life being a entire school, an opportunity for us to learn. We've covered topics in the past, such as karma, forgiveness, you know, how we do and how we don't do. There's been some really interesting conversations in even just the comments that have, people have left from the audience previously there seems to be a bit of a theme at the moment around the word awakening and I'm conscious that it seems like people believe that the world in and of itself is going through an awakening as more and more individuals are awakening but I think it gets construed quite a bit, um, even the term awakening. Um, you know, some people call it enlightenment. Some people call it going beyond the mind. I, for one, have been, I was watching back an old episode um, where I was being interviewed and I said, oh, I had an awakening when I got dep diagnosed with depression because I awoke into a new reality that, oh, you know, something had shifted. But I look back now and I was like, um, maybe you were a bit heavy handed with the word awakening there, Amrit. So I just wanted to sort of ask you the question today about what is in your awareness around the word awakening and, you know, the process around awakening. Um, is it a process? Yeah, like I just open question for you to sort of share with us what your thoughts on awakening are. I think has many answers what awakening means. The first thing which comes to my mind is, of course, um, 
it's the connection with divinity, with God. Uh, the more we have that, the closer we coming to God, the more we so-called awaken, the more we enlighten. And that can done in our three-dimensional world best by being in the here and now. Anybody who is truly in the here and now is with God, because that's the only place where God is. God is only in the here and now. It's not in the tomorrow and not in the yesterdays. So when we are finally able to stay as much as possible in the here and now, and truly see all the inputs and absorb all the inputs and understand the inputs that divinity or life gives us, I think that's the highest form of awakening we can be at the moment. We can study a lot of stuff. We intellectually about all these concepts, partly how I show it in my videos, but that does not lead us to any form of awakening. Awakening only comes through the application of that, what we know. And it's a tough walk because we have left the pure heavens long, long time ago and fell down into the lowest vibration, which we call matter here in the material universe. And we are very much run by our ego. And our ego is usually the one which, which tells us what to do, what we want, what we should do, and what, how we want to impress others, and what for, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to loosen our grip, the, the grip the ego has over us and return back to our true essence, which is a divine eternal being. So the answer is manifold. I think it is living in the here and now and also applying as much as possible the divine laws. And divine laws are very simple, basically love, to love and nothing else. There is, of course, different figures, which means uh, putting order into your life and being compassionate, etc. There are many different forms. But the pr uh, prime reason, the prime purpose for us to be here is to learn to love again. Unlimited, unconditional, all-inclusive and selfless divine cosmic love. That's what we are made of and that's what we return to and we just have forgotten this because our ego has really covered that truth up for us and we have to re-explore it again. Does this halfway answer your question? It does and it begets some other questions for me which I am conscious is leading us away from the here and now. <laughs> so I'm nervous to ask them but I will entertain um, the questioning ego nonetheless. The interesting part you mentioned, well so many interesting parts in there but you know the what I heard is some part of our innate nature is is love is naturally connected to this divine uh source you know and that connection to divinity getting closer and closer to it um is this enlightenment awakening process and so one of the queries that begets the mind is why would i leave what is innate to me like the role of the human path and the journey of diving down into the meta from the heavens to learn to love again, which was something that was my innate nature anyway. Do you understand the nature of my question? I, I think I do. And I can only refer the answer as I have learned it myself intellectually. I cannot remember it because it's too long ago. But apparently we were all divine beings in the absolute reality, which is seven dimensional, which is love, the highest vibration. And a number of these uh, beings, angelic beings, have left uh, left at one time this seven-dimensional reality to make their own creation. Uh, they, they were not quite happy with the way divinity made the creation. They wanted their own creation where they can be the master, which is basically the birth of the ego. So we slowly got ourselves out from the highest vibration, lower and lower vibration, more and more selfish, selfish, selfish. And as we used more and more our selfish will versus the divine will, we separated ourselves more and more from our original true being. So basically, the idea was to create, make your own creation. This is basically what we do with our world here. We do our own creation. We, we do not do divinity. I mean, we create everything which in the absolute reality is for free and available. Like, for instance, to communicate in the absolute reality, we read each other's mind, understand it. Here we have to create computers or telephones, etc. We have satellites here, which we don't need all this kind of communication. We have to build a car or a plane to travel from A to B. In the absolute reality, thought initiates where we travel and to B. So all these things which we here create are very a clumsy kind of replacement or imitations of reality. So that's what we basically created. We created our own mess, so to speak. 
And now we are here and crying and feel very sorry for ourselves and we hurt ourselves because we have forgotten who we truly are, which is love, which is selfless love, being there for everyone else because the highest form of love is service, not me, me, me. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about service and purpose. Before we do, you mentioned seven divine laws and also seven angels. Are they connected? The seven divine laws are the basically, um, that is the God spirit. We, we give it many different ways. We give it uh, consciousness. We call it awakened uh, awareness. We call it a divine being. And the, the seven laws of divinity, which are all, we're talking about vibrations and energy and, and frequency because that's all it is. Everything that exists is nothing but energy, vibration, and frequency. There is no such thing as matter. There is not, no solidity to anything. So the seven-dimensional reality is also nothing else but vibration. You and I are nothing else but vibrations. Um, and so we have to see it from the vibrational point. And when I say the seven laws of divinity, which are order, will, wisdom, justice, patience, love, and uh, n n mercy... They are basically words which we give to this certain kind of powers, vibrations, which, are, which is our true essence of who we are. But we have lost the sense of order. Our lives are very disorderly. The will we have replaced with self-will versus divinity will and so on and so on. So we have to regain these seven powers again in us, which is our true essence. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah. It's... Um... And it's really interesting. I'm hearing things in the back of my head like, you know, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, you know, and noticing that, you know, there are probably different ways to reclaim different parts of the different laws through different methodologies and approaches from all the different spiritual paths. Would you say? Absolutely. Thy will be done. That is the key element to everything. That is the element when we are down, when we are depressed, when etc. Thy will be done. The moment we surrender to the will of divinity, of God's will, whatever it may be. We may not agree with it from our ego level, but it is always the will of love. It is always for the benefit of us, to save us and to help us and to bring us home. Everything what we experience here is nothing else than ways to bring us home. The, all the pain, all the suffering we are having here is nothing else than turn around, stop this nonsense, turn around, come back to love because you are love. Mm. Is there a, is it learning to love more potentially? Because why, why do the whole ego thing? Um, why even make her earth a realm where egos need to function the way that they do? Um, because wouldn't it also be heavenly to just have heaven here on earth and not have to bounce egos off each other? Um, I guess I'm, it's quite an existential question asking the purpose of it all and the purpose of the egos around it all and why they need to be that way. Um, but it is I think I, would, nonetheless. I, would, I think that's actually what's happening. You, uh, you uh, alluded at it earlier that the earth, the planet earth is going to transition and um, all the negativity which we have done to the earth and which we have really created like the pollution, etc., etc as well as a lot of the energy, negative energy, which means uh, the souls who have incarnated, will at a certain time have to leave uh, most part of this planet to make room for a higher vibration of souls of higher vibration. And there we are coming closer to the will of divinity. The moment we are incarnated, or the world is populated by souls of higher vibration, they will use more the law of love and the law of selfless love. So, yes, we are getting to that point. That, again, something echoing in the back of my head is, um, you know, in the Hindu system, you, uh, the evolution of karma and multiple lives, you, like the human life is um, touted or espoused or evangelized, one of those words, as um, this... I don't want to use the word superior incarnation. I'm, I'm lim limited by language, I guess. Um, but a more advanced incarnation, let's use that word. I think that's probably more appropriate. And I'm noticing just the world is becoming more and more populated with humans now um, than what it was in the past. And actually other species are, you know, becoming 
less and less available on the planet, um, in part due to the existence of more and more humans. Does that, is it possible to draw a reflection to sort of say, okay, more and more souls are becoming more and more advanced into this human space and hence, ergo, the entire thing is evolving and becoming more advanced in its own evolution as well? Or am I drawing too many threads together conveniently? I don't know whether you can make that uh, logic. Uh, it may, tr- may be true. The answer is why we have this high, overpop- high population on the planet Earth, I have made a video about. And it's very interesting because the fact that planet Earth is now going through a transition which will be very painful. It will be really up, a lot of upheaval, a lot of earth sh- uh, shaking, uh, sh- shaking things happening here from war to earthquakes, volcanic eruption, etc. That is known in the spiritual world. And in the spiritual world, the spirit, the souls who have a lot of karma says, this is the most perfect time for me to incarnate onto planet earth in these very difficult times where through the pain and enduring of that pain, I can unload most or much of my karma. So what has happened in the year 1900, we had 1.5 billion people here on planet Earth, which was for, for a long time the same figure. It changed drastically to 8 billion in, in, uh, in, in just uh, 100 years, a bit more than 100 years. 8 billion people, it just jumped up. And these are all souls who for the most part came here because of the difficult transitionary times we are going through on planet Earth. They want to undo their own karma. And there are so many, therefore life on planet Earth is a tremendous gift because there are much, many more, billions of more souls who would like to incarnate, but they can't incarnate because of abortion and birth control. There are not enough bodies available. But everybody, every soul knows what's happening on planet Earth and wants to come at this time. Therefore, we suddenly have over 8 billion souls here to go through this very unique time of transition that planet Earth is going through. Can you describe the nature of this transition that we're going through a little bit more? Um, Because I think it is quite intriguing because we do look around and we do see a lot of um, meta examples, material examples of there are a lot more um, bushfires in a lot of places. There are a lot more earthquakes happening. Um, Yeah, there's there's a lot going on um, that uh, seems like a symptom of what you're describing. Can you describe... um, well, you listed or some. We, we all know that the, whenever we switch on the news, there's another disaster. And of course, we have got the wars, which can, the one we are presently experiencing, so the two of them, one of them can easily explode into a major worldwide war. We, we all know that. There is a looming war in uh, uh, Taiwan uh, taking over. So we are having a lot of war potential. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying the potentiality is enormous. And then the water levels rising because the ice caps are, are freezing. So there will be a lot of also f- a starvation of people because uh, the the, uh, the climate changes. There will be so many changes of people or more immigrants are there to, uh, who people are leaving there, who have to leave their, home, uh, their homeland. And Um, It will be pretty tough for many, many souls. I don't want to make it too negative because it is a healing period, a healing period for planet Earth. It's shaking off all these these constructs like we have created, like religion, like commerce, like politics, etc. All these old constructs are suddenly challenged and probably fall by the wayside so that a new world with new ideas and with new concepts can evolve. Whether it's in you or my lifetime happening, I don't know. I have no time schedule on this one. But it is in the making, and we see it everywhere. So instead of getting depressed about it, let's take it as an opportunity and let us become very, very much aware of it, that we all, you and I and every listener, have consciously chosen to come into this lifetime at this time. Some very few one also came here to help other uh, in this period as helpers. They're not necessarily coming for a karmic reason to clear their karma. Some have come here to help and and assist in this time of transition. But nobody is here against their will. Even if the wind may blow so strong and disparate, and we may be very very down on everything, it's the truth is that we have chosen to be. We knew exactly what was going to happen because. It was shown to us prior our incarnation 
the possibilities of what will happen on this planet Earth. Nothing is written in stone, but the possibility, the possible vibration, what will it take place on planet Earth was shown to us before we incarnated. I'm hearing what you're saying is what got us here won't get us there is something that I often find when that just comes up in my everyday 3D coaching stuff as well. You know, we sort of implement some strategies and they work to a certain point and then after a certain point they start to become stale decay and actually in some instances actually hold you back after a while as well um and i can appreciate that there are probably many things like you described reaching their use by date and hence a, a transition is is uh underway and afoot um the the query that pops in for me is you mentioned, and I think I'd like to just zoom in on this a little bit more, is, you know, the opportunity now of being alive in this time and the opportunity to really, I don't want to call us the karma cleanup crew, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but something to that effect. I can see rubber gloves and garbage trucks <laughs> driving around somewhere, cleaning up karma at this particular opportunity in time. Um yeah, and just feeling into, yeah, it potentially being, uh, you know, we've, we've referred to it as, or you refer to it as the, um, the, the we, I love your philosophy so much, I'm adopting them, um, the, the school of, um, the school of life and the opportunity to like the life school. It seems like a bit of an exam, um, an exam period. If there's, if, if I can use that, like a transition at the moment, seems like a bit of an exam where there, it is quite stressful. Um, what you're describing um, and I'm sure that some people will buckle under the pressure and some souls will you know really find their center amongst the winds like you described Touchwood is that a, a call to do the work per se uh, be present here and now and potentially um, to potentially awaken just to bring it back to where we started the the, the line of questioning? I, I would say so. I, if, if we don't wake up now, when we will be? Because if a soul does not wake up in this lifetime, when things are going very tough and we are still clinging to our ego and what we want for our own and we die, we haven't changed. We will, in, we will be in the spiritual realm with like-minded souls. Mm -hmm. We will be there stuck, basically, it's very long because it will... Uh, the evolution of the soul is very different in the spiritual realm when we are surrounded by like-minded people. When everybody else is depressed or everybody else believes this, what everybody else, there is no information. There is not much growth happening there. It's a long time. So time, of course, is differently perceived in the spiritual realm than here. But we can say that it will take a long time for the soul to wake up and move on. If we miss the opportunity in this lifetime to do as much possible clearing up of our karma as we can. So it's really very, it's, it's an absolute unique opportunity to be here. It's a gift which, as I said, for thousands of years, souls have been waiting for this one. And now it happens and you and I and we are all at this, the doorstep of this great event. And it may look gloomy, but behind that gloominess is relief. It's just like an illness. It's not great to be sick, but it is an outflowing of karma. Once the illness is over, the karma is gone and we are free. It's a transition of getting free from all that what bound us. This bleeds into one of the other things I wanted to talk to you today about, which was where we go well, it's a twofold sort of question. I sort of see Earth here now as I'm talking to you and sort of the space beyond and, you know, where we go after and where we came from before. Um, and, yeah, you mentioned, you know, how our time is spent here implies sort of the company we keep after here, which when I'm saying it out loud, it makes a lot of sense, but it's quite the concept, <laughs> to be honest. Can you unpack that concept a little bit further? I know you were just speaking to it, um, but if you can, yeah, just ground that in for myself and the audience a little bit further, I think, yeah, it's, uh, it's novel to some degree. 
Well, we are in, as I mentioned earlier, what we call a temporary reality. The absolute reality explained is a seven dimensional where we came from, who we truly are, and we have left that. And we are in the temporary reality, which has time and space, cause and effect and contrasts. All these things do not exist in that we're saying in the absolute reality. So we are dealing here with time and space. We are dealing here with cause and effect, which is karma. Karma doesn't exist in the real reality because there's no need for karma. <clears throat> but here is karma uh, and it comes back to us. Whatever we have sown, we will reap. We know that law. And it depends on how much we have used our self will, our ego will and hurt other people. It depends as much as we, we have removed ourselves from the source, from this, from the absolute reality. So the more we have basically sinned against love, the more we have removed ourselves. And wherever we are in the spiritual realm, which are there are planets like planet Earth, but they are not material, they are in the spiritual planets. And there we live in, in by the law of like attracts like, which means we are surrounded by the same type of people who believe the same thing, who do the same thing like we do. We're not even aware that we are spirit beings or whatever. We are just sort of following like a big herd. And um, when you are surrounded by only people who think like you yourself, it is very, very difficult to even perceive a different viewpoint. Now, all the time, in the spiritual uh, realms of purification, there are teaching angels who come and tell the souls, look, this is went wrong, you can make changes here, and you can improve your, uh, your life. But it's very slow. The souls are not easy to listen. You have to be on some real deep pain. And to, when you no longer want to be stuck in this gray, dark, astral kind of sphere that you eventually says, I had enough, and you follow your spirit guide or a spirit angel more into the light and you follow their advice so life in the spiritual realm can be very difficult particularly in the lower spheres and the astral spheres and as higher we get it's more agreeable and more nicer and the closer we come to the seventh reality which is the seven layers um, then uh, of course life can be nearly as wonderful as it is in the absolute reality so we have the choice where we want to be purely by how much love we are and how much love we give. It really um, transforms the vision of Earth into a bit of a, a launching pad um, into, you know, the time that you'll spend after you're alive um, and really ask the Karma cleanup crew, <laughs> sorry, I'm back there, to put on their rubber gloves and, you know, their rubber boots as well and their overalls and really to do the work, um, if you will, um, knowing that, yeah, time spent here is very different to the time, even the concept of time on the other side is very different, um, and that potentially you'll be spending so much more or less, who knows, depending on what you're up for next. Um, but, yeah, like you said, you know, the different planets, different states, different realms, I'm sure those are just terminologies that help our mind understand. It's probably even more and even less than whatever than what we can comprehend um in that space it really yeah like i said makes this human experience um like a bit of a launch pad for what's next as a bit of an opportunity almost can i draw that conclusion absolutely it's a gift the planet Earth was given to us as a gift because it is unique, this planet, compared to the other planets in the universe, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, temporary reality, because, as I said, all the other planets go by the law of like attracts like. Planet Earth is one of the places where you can incarnate as a soul for a limited time of, what is it, 30,000 days, which is the average lifetime, and you are surrounded by souls who are incarnated from different planets, from, uh, different areas of the purification spheres, which have different beliefs, different nationalities, different religions, different sects, whatever. So we are suddenly surrounded by a multitude of different ways of thinking. And we also, which is very important, are encountering souls who we may have heard in previous lifetimes and to with whom we have karma, which are in the spiritual world, maybe in a very different kind of location than where we are. And we have no way to meet each other and undo our karma. But here on planet Earth, we can come together and undo our karma. So the planet Earth is a tremendous gift. 
and anybody of your viewers is interested, I, I did make the video you mentioned earlier. It's called The Amazing Planet, uh, uh, Planet Earth School, where I describe it very clearly. And the other uh, uh, wonderful video, I think it's wonderful because it explains it wonderfully, is, is the, um, the path of the soul, where exactly the seven layers, as I mentioned earlier, are explained of how the soul goes from one layer to the other. When you see it, it becomes so much clearer. That's why I do the videos and do it visually so people can see how it works. And uh, then I try to explain it in words and I struggle with the English language, but I think I'm doing my best I can. <laughs> so you are I'm... doing amazing. <laughs> selling yourself short. But yeah, we'll put a link to both videos in the show Correct. notes below yeah. for people mm -hmm. to go check out for sure, just right. to inform. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really powerful. Sorry, have I interrupted? No, you haven't. No, no. I don't know whether I've answered your question fully. That, that, but because I think you've asked what is the planet Earth and the planet Earth is a gift from divinity for us to really undo our karma in the fastest possible way. It is painful, but it is the most fastest way. It's like ripping off the, the bandaid from your hand versus doing it very, very slowly. It's so painful. So we come here. It's tough. It's hard. It's a very hard school for most people here. But it is a wonderful way to let go of big chunks of the karma if we do it right through forgiveness, asking for forgiveness, repenting, and uh, no longer doing the same mistakes. Yeah, and we're going through a bit of an exam period at the moment as well. So one of the things you um, you touched on, which was also one of the rabbit holes I wanted to just explore today, was also you said, you know, there are opportunities in this lifetime where we potentially meet other souls, beings, um, where we yeah, may have some karma connected to the other souls slash beings and we come here to earth to potentially unwind or work through or heal, um, pick your word, I guess. Um, uh, <laughs> I find myself trying to articulate the inarticulate um, uh, through, by the way, I didn't say this, but your English is amazing. <laughs> Sorry, I just tangent. Your English is amazing. You're doing amazing. Thank you. Um, but yeah, the coming here on the earth and just the concept around soul contracts, um, trying to, because I've heard that you, word used a lot in spiritual circles and I think it gets, I don't know, it, it's used a lot and I'm not sure if it has, maybe people have a lot of awareness around what they're talking about. I, for one, don't really understand what it really means. Hearing you talk about um, beings with karma in one lifetime, potentially wanting to come back to work it out, maybe starts to open the conversation a little bit around what my awareness could start to understand soul contracts mean. Is that what it's alluding to? Can you explain soul contracts a little bit and maybe what people mean by that and what you would call it? Yeah, the way I understand it is basically to help us to grow. For instance, we can most of us come here to undo our karma, but we can also come here to learn certain qualities of life, like, for instance, compassion, loving, caring, etc. Some really divine qualities which for in past lifetimes we have lost. And therefore, we may have make a, a soul contract with another soul in the purification sphere, as it says, who would agree to incarnate together at the same time like ourselves and be our adversary, for instance, or be giving us a difficult times or maybe even helping us as well in whatever form. They make a contract with us that says, all right, you understand, you want to learn now to become compassionate. I will incarnate with you and I will give you tasks and situations to make sure that you learn compassion. So that is a form of soul contract where another soul incarnates not for their own karma necessarily. They can do that as well in addition to that, but they also come mainly to help you on your way to clear up certain things. So when they are here on planet Earth, and of course we have totally forgotten these arrangements, then of course suddenly there comes this father-in-law suddenly into our life and he is awful. He gives us hell. He is, is, is challenging every moment and sort of destroys my full self-confidence and so on. And he is sort of giving me a really difficult time. And I really curse him and situation, etc. But in truth, he came as an angel to make me aware of something that I'm doing wrong, something that I have not understood. Maybe my compassion, my love, my caring has to grow. And he is the person like a catalyst who helps me to suddenly do the next step to grow in a certain area. 
Does that answer your question sort of in a way? It, it really does. And um, it actually um, picks at a, I don't want to say, it touches on a thread is probably the right way I want to say, um, on one of, the, one of the threads of the comments of our previous um, videos is when we discussed karma, um, it challenged a lot of people in the, not a lot, some of the people in the audience that were quite vocal in the comment section about, you know, some people coming and, you know, the difficult relationships we have with certain individuals, reframing that and under and looking at it as a potential opportunity for our spiritual evolution still triggered some people saying no, like um, that cannot be an excuse for their behavior. Um, yeah. And just sitting somewhere between the meta dynamic and the spiritual dynamic of relationships. Well, it's such a, such a slippery slope in there. <laughs> No, I think uh, your, your listeners uh, are right. It is not an excuse for somebody to abuse me in any form or way. And for that, we have to make a stop and we, have, we should not allow another person to abuse us uh, in, uh, excessively because uh, that also adds karma to that person. So out of compassion for the abuser, we say stop. We either move out from there, we, we remove ourselves from the situation if we can. So yes, it is not uh, the uh, the soul contract does not include violence or hurt, uh, tremendous hurt. It can be a reflection. It can be aggravation. For instance, somebody feels threatened by another person. Uh, everything in our life is nothing but a mirror. So suddenly, somebody comes into our life and he feels threatened. Says, "Where am I threatening myself? Whom am I threatening?" So the person basically comes into our life as a mirror. Because like affects like, the person is only in our life because we are doing something similar. I'm taking, we are coming back to the word abuse, like spouse abuse. There's a person who hurts physically, etc., cetera, and one person, which is not okay. And it should be sort of stopped whenever we can. But if the person does it, the, the abuser is doing nothing else than reflecting back to the abused of what the abused is doing to himself or herself. In other words... The abused person does have the same message, uh, the same, uh, the, why does a, an abused person allow an abuser to abuse them? Because he doesn't feel uh, right about them. He has got a very low self-esteem. I'm no good. I deserve it. I'm etc. I'm not, I'm nothing. I don't count. And then the abuser comes into their life and physically maybe or verbally attacks the person to show them that this is exactly what you are doing to yourself. Mm, the like abuser is a mirror. The abused and a light yeah. coming from the abuser. Yeah, sorry. Please. Yeah, everything around us is a mirror of ourselves. Whatever upsets us in another person, in a situation, is something that is not love in ourselves. And there is no exception to that rule. I've tried to find it many times in my life that, oh, I don't do that. I can't be. Oh, yes, I do. If you go deep enough into ourselves, we always find that whatever upsets us in another person is something that we do to ourselves or to someone else as well. Okay, a bit of a personal question from that place then, because there is then the conversation comes home to installing boundaries for me um, in terms of having healthy boundaries. Um, because, you know, if that is happening, that's the, the onus is on me to then also be empowered to have healthy boundaries where possible. That's kind of where I feel um, we're leading to. So, but I can also imagine that there is a world of difference intentionally, um, in the intention, sorry, between erecting boundaries from a place of this is what's really good for me versus this is what I'm trying to avoid from you. They probably look like the same boundaries, but the intention at the heart of them is quite different. Um, if I'm erecting boundaries from the latter, which is saying I want to repel such and such, I'm probably just going to end up attracting more of the same. Am I not? Your thoughts on such boundaries? If I don't recognize why the person is in my life, definitely. Mm. Definitely. As we have, for instance... The person always marrying the same type, the same, the third and sixth husband or wife is similar, the same thing. Yes. Same we can person, read. different face. <laughs> they learn the message. 
if we remove <laughs> ourselves, which we should do, then only if we recognize why on earth did this person ever come to me into my life in the first place? And then I will come to recognition and self-recognition. And then I will, once I've cleared that up within myself, the next person will be different. So it doesn't help us. Of course, we have to remove ourselves. But remember, there are a lot of people, abused people, who love to be abused because, unfortunately, they do not leave the abuser. They always go back to them to have more and more until they wake up, until it's too much. So, yes, I fully agree. We do need boundaries for ourselves as well as for the abuser. But not everybody is ready to use the boundary because some people like the pain. It numbs other pain and it does a lot of other things, unfortunately. So we have to sort of do the one step and just, this is sick. That's it. Let's look at it, our lives. This is sick. I have, can't be with this person any longer and make a real decision. I'm going to leave. And again, when we make such a decision, people are always very scared to make this because suddenly means I have to live somewhere else. It's it how this is. All these things we do never alone. We have got the whole bounty of heaven on our side when we make a positive step into the right direction. It says, please, God, please, divinity, help me so that I can make the next step to remove myself from this difficult situation. I understand why I do it. I have had very, self, very low self-love and self-respect. This is what's reflected to me by that person. But now, since I understand it, I have to leave this situation. Please help me. And the love and the support and the help is given to us. We are never, ever alone. It is amazing when we truly ask for the guidance, for the good for ourselves and for others, the guidance and help that is offered and can like we can find in places we never thought about that suddenly there is a door opening and we can move, go through this door and leave this disturbing relationship behind. Some people claim to have processes that can cut energetic ties, um, you know, between relationships, let go of attachments between people. Um, but hearing some of the karmic relationships, karma being action, cause and effect, um, can certain things be cut so simply or do they properly need to be unwound through some of the seven dimensions of love that you meant, uh, dimensions of divinity that you mentioned earlier. Um, is it as simple as sort of, and okay, I'll give you a practical example so I can actually make some sense of it. Some people will go through a process where they visualize a cord cutting exercise in a meditation um, and they, you know, find themselves cutting cords for relationships they know or they don't know. Um, but it seems like soul contracts and relationships go significantly deeper than that to some degree. Um, am I mistaken? Well, we're not no sure for sure whether the person they want to free themselves from is, is necessarily bound through a soul contract. But I would like to give another example, the example of a, a, a medic, in, a doctor. If we have got, let's for instance, cancer, the solution in the Western world is to cut the body open, take the cancer out, heal it, and so on. You are done with it. That is basically cutting off the cancer, but it has not done anything to the cause of the cancer. And the same thing when we suddenly cut ourselves suddenly off through any kinds of spiritual techniques and so on. Yes, they are cut off, but have we learned from the situation? Have we healed? Have we made the changes so that the that the next person is not attracted by the same vibration which we send out. If we, the, the cutting off is only useful if we have made the change, because otherwise we are having the same vibration. We are having the same vibration. Now the other person may be gone, but I'm still vibrating out the same vibration, and I will attract another person of same vibration who gives me the same difficulties. So the question is, have I done my work of self-recognition, of healing, clearing up or whatever it is that is disturbing in me, then the cutting off would probably take place automatically because I, once I have moved myself into a higher frequency, the other person is no longer interested in me. Thank you so much for clearing that up. I, we've discussed this in parts before and maybe there's a, I'm going to ask a question today again. 
um, regardless just because of where we are now. Um, moving our way through the two greater levels of awakening through to more and more love, um, the journey, you mentioned the, the multiple dimensions. You also mentioned at the beginning it's, it's an art of being present here and now as much as possible. Um, I think grounding in the conversation a little bit to some practical things that people can do. You mentioned forgiveness as an incredible tool. Um, I've got a meditation that I, you know, guide myself through that I've recorded and shared on YouTube. Um, I find it really helpful to visualize the perpetrator, the perpetration act, and then, you know, allowing me to sort of learn from the lesson. Um, touch wood, what are some of the, the practical ways that we can, um, yeah, be present um, to the work that's required to allow a lot of this to settle and I don't want to use the word mitigated because that sounds very Western again. Um, healed is probably the right word. Yeah. I think you mentioned it. The, the first thing which comes to mind is, of course, a form of meditation to learn to still our mind for a while. That with already a major step, many people are afraid to learn to meditate or they think they can't do it because they've got too much high expectations of what meditation should be. But it's basically really calming the chatting monkey in our mind for a while. But the other important thing is, I think, to be aware of our feelings, of our emotions throughout the day. The moment we focus on our feeling and our emotion, what do I feel right now? What is happening? What's going on? That moment I'm the here now. That moment I'm self-recognizing what may be the issue here. Instead of being totally in my mind and moving on, moving on, moving on, to remind ourselves over and over again to check our feeling at as much as often as possible throughout the day. I think that's the most important thing. The moment we do that, we are automatically in the here and now, we are automatically trying to find out what it is, what bothers us, what upsets us, what makes us fearful, what makes us upset, or what makes us give joy as well. It's energy. It doesn't have always negative. So becoming aware of our feelings as they come up is, I think, the, the key element to uh, be in the here and now and to clear up and find actually the practical things that we can clear up and recognize ourselves as, wow, I didn't know I was attracted to this or I hated this or whatever. So there will be amazing self-recognition taking place when we are listening to our feelings. And it's very, very difficult for men, particularly, we are not really into our feelings. We find every excuse not to go into our feelings. But it's a learning process. And as I said, whenever we want to learn something and we ask the divinity to help us throughout the day, help is given to us. It's, it's there. They are here. Look, we have got billions of spirit beings behind us, with us. They want nothing else than for us to stop this stupid life of selfishness, which has created so much mess on this planet Earth and everywhere else in the astral fields and Earth. So let's stop it. Let's go all come home. And so whatever we want to do to clear up, bring life and love into our own life and life of others, they are here to help us. So just never be afraid to ask for help and help and help because it's given there. That's their purpose. That's why they come here. That's why they're here. And they are happy to help because the highest form of love is service. Mm. How do we ask for help, Hans? I'm sure there's many different ways, but what's one of your favorite ways to just ask for help? Oh, you can do it right at the moment. God, I need you right now here. I need you to right help because I, what can I do here? Or you just go within and says, I need to, and just sort of calming down with giving some several deep breath, I think, and just listen what comes up, guide me and so on. What can be done? Or just leave it up. So it says, look, I, I, I realize this is a problem. I'm having done mistake again. Uh, show me next time when it comes up again so that I can stop it before I fall back into the same trap again. So we can ask these practical <clears throat> help and uh, the help is there. Uh, it takes a long time to get used to this science and help uh, because we are just not used to rely on other uh, sources. We only we are used to rely on our ego and our ego knows exactly how to get our attention with our desires, with our wishes and wills and our ego is so strong, so to suddenly have to listen to another source is pretty unfamiliar for most of us. But it's there, and if the, the voice is just much finer, much more delicate, much more uh, your spiritual, maybe the word, it's not the loud as the ego is. Mm. 
there's um you mentioned the ego and its desires and I've been contemplating this a little bit recently just watching my desires as they emerge and for material things in particular and recognizing oh okay there there is there's me there's this part of me that identifies with me again you know um through what you were describing before I loved your response around meditation and particularly the emotions the self-inquiry that's available there and I can sort of see as I'm reaching for a desire for something material oftentimes underneath there there is an emotion um sometimes one of lack sometimes one of seeking joy generally lack um and feeling into it yeah I've start oh well again the ego trying to master emotions so pardon me for this <laughs> but one of the things that popped in was you know the idea that the desire to be desireless or transcend my desires is quite the desire is it could just be a bit of a koan just wanted to get your sentiments on my unravelings i guess well that is a desire of course <laughs> to be the desire <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 very high. It's I am. I, I would uh, I would not go into that area because um, desire is a, a prime energy in creation. Firstly, it has to come the desire, then comes intention, then comes the will, then comes uh, the deed, and eventually the the action, uh, the action and, and and our destiny. So, desire as such is not necessarily something negative. It's just a question of where it does come from. And most of our ego desires come from getting energy because we, we feel, as we have removed ourselves from source, we feel always or most of us empty. That's why we do coffee and tea and sex and all these kind of things. And we want a lot of approval, acknowledgement from other people, which is nothing but energy. That is only our ego who once said. And when we really look at all the stuff that our ego leads us to, to do, approval, acknowledgement, acceptance, etc., this is all ego stuff. It's all energy. I want your energy. I want your energy to feel good again. So we are using outside energy to make us feel good again. And there is a spiritual law that says every energy that I take from others, I eventually in another lifetime have to give back. That is not my energy. We have to learn to live from the energy within. And there's abundance of energy, divine energy in each one of us. But uh, our ego uh, prefers to take outside energy. It's all about energy, basically. All it's fight for energy. You, you take the wars in the world, it's energy, whether it's oil, whether it's uh, slaves, whether it is uh, gold, whatever it, it may be. It's all energy, energy, energy. People are feeling, have, uh, human beings, have lost the source of energy and tried to supplement it with energy from other people. Right. The loop you described, well, you didn't describe it as a loop. The sequence you described sounds like a bit of a loop as well. Like if your desire can be aligned to thy will, the desire of destiny through intention and will, maybe that seems like a quite a, a wholesome loop. Um, is it, is it a loop? Um, I don't know whether it's a loop, but uh, yeah, if we just sort of surrender to the divine will, thy will be done. And you, if you can also say thy desire will be done and, and yeah, thy attention will be done. All these things you can say, but we are used to the word thy will be done from our, our Lord prayer uh, because it's simple. But I only mentioned the, the desire because it's, it implied more or less like desires itself are negative. It's corrupted, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm not so sure about that one because Thank without desire, that. there would be no creation. Mm. So we have the initial things is, is, is always a desire to create something. So therefore, I think there's a divine desire and there's an ego desire. Got it. You've mentioned a couple of times. Um, yeah, just and I don't want to turn this into a dark episode, but you've mentioned a couple of times the, the war is potentially looming. Um, your thoughts on the state of the current world, like you said, we're going through a transition. Um, I just find it, and maybe it's just because of the demographic that I'm in and the work that I do through this podcast, you know, Touchwood, trying to champion positivity to the best of my ability, um, that it seems ironic that we are not a peace-waging species by now, <laughs> you know, and maybe that is the opportunity for yeah, just to get your sentiments on on that, like 
my expectations and you know they're just my expectations i'm just amrit um but yeah it's it's i think so many people around the world are surprised that we're not a peace waging species by now um yeah are you surprised well i'm not trying to put blame on it but uh, let's look at it it is usually the males who are unfortunately to the point lovable when a young boy grows up, what's the first thing he does on the it's just computer games. It's killing people all the time. And then later on, they do they learn they want guns, etc. And uh, going to soccer games and football. This is nothing else than a form of war. In, in the group uh, group game, uh, ball games, in in just basically the same thing. You want to destroy your part, uh, the opposite and so on. The same things. And later on. A lot of people go to war because they find this exciting, the males. There's something very strange. There's a famous general in America, Jan Patton, uh, who says, I love war. Males love war. Not all males, of course. I don't want to be misunderstood here. But there is something why men love war. That's one reason. The other reason is, of course, unfortunately, that when we grow up in every society there we are, we download the programs of the, our environment in the first seven years of our life. And that can be our teachers, that our family, and very often it's a religion. So it's the first seven years, and then we stay very often in these environments, and then we learn, we never question what we have learned, the programs of the first seven years of our life. So when you see now people... Muslim people, Jewish people fighting each other. They are fighting the programs of their childhood. I know this is not what they say. They give other reasons for that, what for why they fight. But they are fighting belief systems, are defending the belief system, which they have never questioned, really questioned, for the most part. Not everybody, their exception, I'm generalizing here. But it's not only there. It's the same in Russia. It's the same in Ukraine. They are all fighting belief system for most part, we have adopted ourselves when we were young and never questioned it because in our environment, that was the accepted form of believing, of living, of worshipping, and therefore that must be true. But is it really true for ourselves, for our higher selves? Is this really based on love, whatever I believe or defend? If it's not based on love, and compassion and kindness, then these programs are all false and they are ego programs. Like most of the religions are, they're based on fear. So we are defending these ego programs to in, very, in, in political forms, in wars, and in every way. So unfortunately, it is the unquestioned belief systems that drives us to act out as an adult the programs we learned as a child. Yeah, it's interesting. There's um, a study was done recently and they found that 48% of the population um, at the moment have the same religion that their parents had. Um, that's a significant number and it used to be higher, um, but maybe that's part of the transition <laughs> and the shift that we're undergoing. Um, yeah, and we, we sort of just fall in. And when I think about... Because religion is is a topic that runs very deep and has a lot of attachments and hooks and you know brings a certain baggage to 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 the com to conversations. But you know, as a coach, I often end up speaking to people and it's like, what belief systems did you install of your own, and what belief systems belong to the collective? And you know, many things we can start to unpick, but the religion one is often one that you know is very difficult to unpick. Um, and as I'm saying that, I'm saying that for myself as well. Like I have adopted my father's religion and it seems to be deeply wound in as a rudder for me in my life as well. You know, I'm not pointing the finger on like those people, myself included. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting feeling. Inside. Thank you for sharing your your insights on that and, and yeah, just um, and potentially where where this comes from because I do find – I still maintain my position that it, it is still, I don't want to use the word harrowing, but surprising is probably the right word, that we're not a peace war, a peace waging species just yet. Another query that I had, and again, this is um, back to what we were discussing a little bit earlier, was in the transition. We're going through the transition now, and it is also a really interesting time because there is this massive birth of artificial intelligence coming through. 
And I know it's, I haven't really seen a video on Life Explained on artificial intelligence yet. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask, but part of me is hungry to ask. So I wanted to sort of see what your thoughts are on in terms of, yeah, just what your sentiments around artificial intelligence are at the moment. Is it um, another symptom of the transition and is it a supportive one or is it one that's potentially adding to the challenge or yet to sort of be seen what it is here to support us with? Um, Yeah. Well, I do have a video which is close to it. It's called Intelligence versus Intellect. And yeah, no, that that basically explains very briefly, and I think that's where we find the answer for the AI as well, is um, our intellect always wants to find answers to things. And uh, for instance, if we take an example of hunger, world hunger and so on, then we invent things like fertilizer, etc. We may land and we create new land, etc. And new crops, etc. All intellectual forms of solving the problem. Intelligence doesn't do that. The intellect finds all ways, and all these things cost money, by the way. So they're all are binding people. So we're finding all replacement. We never go to the source of the problem. The source of the problem of hunger is our various forms. For instance, if we would all switch over to a vegetarian diet, 90% of the crops uh, just for, for meat production, there suddenly would be available. There would be no hunger, basically. If you just only this very simple, but this doesn't cost, that doesn't cost any money. So our intellect continuously produces stuff which we want to buy, which we want to have, the iPhone, etc., which we think are convenience and great, but it is the opposite to intelligence. Intelligence is love. Intelligence is God. God is the divine intelligence. And when we come from intelligence, we don't need all this stuff. We just have to go back to the source of what is the problem and solve it there and not find intellectual stuff. And AI is probably, it should be actually called artificial intellect, not artificial intelligence for that many reasons, because it replaces intelligence. It gives us a lot of wonderful tools, which seem to be wonderful, like the intellect does. The intellect does us, for instance, in, in medical medicine is the same way. Medicine, our intellect invents medicine, cures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which are very expensive and people are, uh, have that. But the fact is, sickness is karma. If we solve the karma, we wouldn't be sick. That doesn't cost any money. That's intelligence. So in my video, I explain it very clearly on different examples, the difference between intellect and, um, and, and intelligence. So I would say that the uh, artificial intelligence should be called artificial intellect. And um, I cannot see uh, it at any really major breakthrough. As It may give us more tools in the future to solve some problems, but it's all surface, surface, surface. Deep down, whatever we are facing is karmic and there we have to do the clearing up and the understanding where it comes from learn to forgive repent no longer do the mistakes and everything else is just only covering it up Mm. so looking at the conversation we've had today we've had the opportunity to recognize that you know earth is a bit of a launch pad as well and again i keep calling in the karma cleanup crew <laughs> maybe that's the title of this episode i don't know um maybe the thumbnail but yeah the karma cleanup crew like earth is a bit of a launch pad for where we go because life attracts a like attracts like um from where we go after here but then also in the time we've spent here in the time we've spent beyond there are you know connections that are woven formed through the actions that we are a part of and life is an opportunity also to wind through unwind some of that work through some of that karma um and it's quite a blessed opportunity in this particular time that we're alive to work through some of this stuff just because of the nature of where the world is specifically at and at the heart of all of that is doing the work that we started off the conversation with which is around individual awakening as we're going through this collective transition and awakening um and at the heart of it is spending some time to meditate and be with ourselves and then also in the day-to-day literally doing the work of self-inquiry through witnessing our emotions as they arise am i oversimplifying everything that we talked about today You obviously were listening to our conversation. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I think that's basically it. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an incredible time to be born. It's tough for, for many people, for most of us, but it's an incredible time. And I think one of the most important things is to be really grateful in spite of all the negativity. Be grateful who we are, what we have. Find something around us to be grateful for that immediately brings us into a different form of of awareness, it brings us also in the here and now, which is really another form, just not the emotion, but also gratefulness. What am I grateful for just right now? Suddenly we are no longer the future and the past, but we're finding something around us and this immediately changes our chemical reaction in our body and uh, brings up the positive hormones. Oh, Hans. And as you know, on that note, I am so grateful <laughs> for you <laughs> because it is always such a pleasure to have you on. Like there is always, life can feel like such a constellation and, you know, like a spinning galaxy solar system with all the things that are going on in our lives. And somehow I find these conversations and I know the audience feels the same way just on how well these conversations with yourself are received, touch wood. It just is so centering to just come back to, oh, right. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience and just understanding a little bit more about, you know, just the humanness of the tendencies that are presenting themselves as symptoms through this process and just coming back to spirit and recognizing, okay, you know, spirit has its way, has its path and understanding that a little bit further does actually support the mind on its journey. And I'm just so grateful for you again. And thank you so much for doing this again, round three. I'm just so grateful, Hans. Thank you. I enjoyed it too. I really learned always a lot from this. So yes, I appreciate that you uh, took the time and invited me and maybe we do it again anytime. Thank you, Amrit. Really, it was wonderful. Love you, Hans. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching this video all the way to its end. Obviously, you absolutely love this podcast and I want to thank you so much for watching this all the way through. Here is another video that's perfectly curated just for you to watch as the next best video to keep your inspiration flowing, to keep you evolving, to keep you yelling. Check it out now.